<laughs> he really did. <laughs> uh, to present some uh, of the very nice results he recently also published uh, about cluster crystals. Looking forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, in fact, uh, I'm going to give you a talk that I gave recently. That's why I, I presented volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave recently this talk in, a, in an international conference in Rome organized by Andrea Puglisi and Angelo Vulpiani about statistical mechanics of uh, small systems. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you is about cluster crystals, what essentially are a crystal of clusters. And I will talk about uh, equilibrium and non-equilibrium. This work is, uh, has been mainly done with, uh, with Jan Baptiste Delfort, who was a postdoc uh, in the last two years, working with me and with Emilio. Also, of course, with Emilio, and then there are some other collaborators like Hélène Olivier, who was a master's student in, in her last year. She came from Cachan, Segle, and she also collaborated with us on this topic. And Ben Blasio, who is a full professor in, at the University of Oldenburg in, in Germany. Okay, the outline of my talk, I hope I will spend around 40, 45 minutes. Uh, is the following. I will, I will give a, an introduction. Then uh, I divided the talk into parts, the part of equilibrium, where I will talk about part formation in, in system of Brownian particles with exclusively repulsive forces. So all the forces I will show here are repelling. The particles are all the time repelling. Then uh, I will show numerical results, and then we will try to explain analytically via the already famous Dinka Wasaki equation, how this part information will arise. Then the second part of the talk, uh, I will show the most recent, or most recent result of that you can call it active matter studies on this topic, where essentially we will, uh, I will do essentially the same that in the first part. I will study uh, a system of radial particles, but with some kind of activity, and also with uh, repelling forces, and then I will try to explain them also with uh, the Dinkawasaki equation. And finally, I will show you this summary. So interaction. Well, a uh, common way to study complex systems is via the collection of interactive particles. OK? So many models, we already know this, consist in particles interacting via forces. And the forces are of uh, biological, physical, chemical, social, or whatever origin. And then you say you study this or this other system. OK? And applications. Applications we, we see uh, every day in our work. Colloids, active matter, flocking, ecosystem dynamics in particular, uh, vegetation patterns, uh, muscles, patterns, etc. In, in this talk in particular, I will focus on pattern formation. OK? Nice pattern that one should always show in a at least in an introduction. You, you can see the first patterns that I know are these patterns of, from aggregation of bacteria, Escheria coli, yeah. around 1991. Then you can see all the patterns. You are already see flocking patterns, vegetation patterns. You, you take Google Earth and, for instance, you go to Kalahari Desert or whatever. With Google Earth, you can see very nice patterns with Google Earth. Now it's becoming Google Earth a, a, nice, a, a nice technique to study vegetation patterns. And uh, you can find uh, also other, other patterns in biological systems. For instance, I like this, particularly this one that you can take from, from the internet in the Van de Koppel, from Van de Koppel lab. I think that he's in, Netherlands, in the Netherlands. You can see how the masses, these are patterns in the field, the masses form these patterns. And you can show these patterns also in, in the lab. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about spatial organization of patterns. OK. Uh, what else? Uh, well, we know that in physical system, interactions are typically derived from two body potentials, that they act repulsively or attractively, okay, at different distances. For instance, we all know the energy of potential. That is quite common when you study uncharged atoms or polymer or polymer solutions. Uh, you, you, you can see here that in the, in, the short, in the short scale, you have some kind of repulsion due to the size of the particles. And in the long range, you have some kind of attraction. And it's well known that the layer of potential gives rise to what is called crystallization, so to a solid. This is a physical system. In biological system, 
for instance, you, it is already affected the most of the biological systems uh, at, at via two mechanisms. One is facilitation, another one is competition. Facilitation is essentially the contrary of competition. And they are at different scales. So how affecting growth and death rates. For instance, you have, I put here a tree. Here a tree where you have a long range competition because the trees uh, compete due to the, the roots. And then you have short range facilitation of the crown of the, of the trees. So if you, but you understand more or less, no? You compute the root of the last case competition due to the roots and the short range uh, facilitation and mutualist effects because of the crown. Okay, this is what typically happens in biological and physical systems. And there is a general belief that you can see. Uh, I will I would try to focus my my introduction and my thoughts to biological system, even if everything I will do, I will do in physical systems. But this is a general belief, as, as I said before, that typically for cluster formation, you need somehow uh, short range attraction to make the party, to make the cluster grow and then uh, to start the aggregation, and then you need some kind of long-range repulsion to stop it. So this is a general belief that, that is more or less widely affected. However, uh, there are many recent studies that goes against this, and this, this will be my focus. Particularly, we, le we learned recently that people in, in the group of Christoph Likos in, in Vienna, uh, they work in, essentially in condensed matter, in liquids, in soft matter, that they, 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 I think they were the first to introduce this, this name of cluster crystal. A, that, that is a, a, a crystal of cluster of particles. They show that with soft core reproducing all interactions, you, you may have aggregates. Okay, we'll, let me go more in detail in the following. Also, we already did some years ago, we started essentially in biological system with, when Simone Pigotti was here, we read a very nice paper by Sheffer, a very influential paper by Sheffer Maness, where they studied the clustering of species in the niche space. Where despite the competitive exclusion, that means that you cannot have part, uh, species very, very similar one to the others because of the competition. But these guys saw already, and we, we entered with Pigolotti, as I said, with Simone, and also with Ken Anderson, we entered in the, into the analytical details and to try to explain why. Well, what they show is the, that the species they tend to cluster, even if they compete. Also, with, already with uh, Ricardo in his thesis, we, we focus on vegetation patterns, and we already saw that only with competitive mechanisms, I said before that the general, the general belief that you need competition and you need facilitation, but what we saw is with only competition, you can, ha you can, you can have patterns. The question, well, the question, no, the, the reason why is that we need another ingredient, a part of competition, that you need somehow non-local interactions. So, um, uh, and then we, in all these studies, in particular in the biological one, the ones we did, we enter with one of the mechanisms why you can have this aggregation. We, we come to, to explain with the, what we call exclusion source thumbs. For instance, you have here, why that, do the, the trees, if they only compete, if you make a model of all the trees competing via, with a, with a non-local interaction, why do, they form the, why do they aggregate? Because essentially, uh, what we call exclusion zones, areas where the competition is too high, uh, appear. And here, if the competition is too high, the, the trees, the particles, or whatever, cannot grow up. Cannot, cannot, well, that's, that was uh, our first explanation for this. Well, uh, a part of this, a part of our biological per se interaction, many people ask us typically, why are you so interested in studying clustering? Why, is, why is, it, is it so relevant? Why you in particular, in particular here, Emilio Massey, are for so many years working on this? Let me try to explain why, at least. I'm not sure if I, if I, am, I, am, I am very clear, but for instance, we are interested from an evolutionary point of view. Uh, so evolution pressure, uh, is it trying to, to make the particles increase or decrease their spatial mobility? So that, that, that's a very old question, and many people are already nice working about this. But we, we start, we, we did some papers on this with us, and uh, what I wanted to show you here is that almost at the same time, 
we publish a paper on PLL and Simone Picoletti paper a publish another paper that essentially say the contrary thing. What we say is that if you make cluster, the particles survive, tend to survive. The particles that more cluster, they survive when you put several particles to compete. And Picolotti, uh, Simone and Roberto Vesi, what they say is the contrary. The particles that diffuse faster, diffusion essentially goes against aggregation, then it's a, an, advent, an advent, selective advantage. So trying to understand this is one of, one of our motivations. Is it for the particles in an evolutionary point of view more, import, more interesting, more important, more relevant to cluster or not to cluster? Okay? And then uh, at the biological point of view, not only at the uh, at evolu evolutionary stage. For instance, you can see recently in the nature fruits in, in, in Texas that appear very, in all the newspapers appear the finance that they were forming very big aggregates and they were traveling very long distances to form a new colon, co colony. Um, and also here, I'm already many of you have, have seen that <coughs> Emilia and, and myself are trying in the lab to, to, to study clustering of some organisms. For instance, here, this is what we saw. These are spring tests that we saw there in the, close to the Escola Doctorado. You can see these are particles, these are very small, small insects. They are, but many, many small, small organisms. They are not insects, they are something different. But you can see, well, this is the more famous key. This is a typical size. You can see that they form patterns. And they are moving all around the patterns. And if you take a microscope and you go into more details, you can go here, and you can see the particles moving around. The, the particle essentially what you need is a, a small uh, uh, amount of water. So the, you can see these particles, these are the same particles as here. Right? You see that uh, how they cluster, how they are forming these disaggregates. And in particular, uh, this will be important for what we will say later. If you see this from as a two-dimensional thing, you see the particles are not fine. They overlap one, one each other. It will be relevant for the physics that the particles overlap. Then the question uh, that we are we, we would like to to answer not now, maybe in the in the, in the next year. What are the forces, the physical forces, for these particles to form this? Uh, what are the mechanisms? Like the exclusion zone, is there something similar to this? How the movement of these particles, because you can see, if you see with care, you, you can see that some particles from time to time they make big jumps. So it's a, this movement is not only run in motion. So another question how the movement of these particles determine the clusters? Uh, what is the optimal behavior? What is the role of the environment? So there are many open questions. What is the size of the solution? And at the end, we as physicists, is there any kind? of universality for all living organisms to form cluster or not. Well, these are the, the say, our motivation, why we study these topics. And now I will enter into more details, okay? About what, specifically what we have done in this model, okay? So, obviously, on my talk. So, what I will use to try to, uh, I will use discrete particle dynamics and continuum descriptions to show that repulsive force I want to underline this. All the particles are all the time repulsive, so they are all the time repelling, but despite this, they will get aggregated. They will get aggregated. And mainly to class, will, as, I, as I said, I will use a, an equilibrium system of particles. A study equilibrium, I, I know already that none of us is very much motivated to study equilibrium, but still there are nice problems in equilibrium. And then I will, I will show all more recent um, let's say, generalization to non-equilibrium. And, of course, I will try to explore the condition mechanisms and to study the differences and similarities between non-equilibrium and equilibrium. Okay, so let me start with the first part. And at the, uh, the beginning, what will I use? I will use a system of m Brownian particles interacting via a potential V. Okay, this is my model. In the overdone leaping, I guess that you are already, all of you already know the overdone leaping of the system of Brownian particles in equilibrium, where diffusion, the diffusivity coefficient is essentially proportional to the temperature. Important thing, as I say, this model is a standard model. What do we do for new as a novelty? That we use a repulsive potential of this type. That means that all the particles are repelling all the time. They are interacting via this potential that is in the literature 
and the, for the people of soft matter is very, very well known, this type of potential. It's a kind of effective potential that you may find, that you may calculate between, between some kind of colloids and some kind of, I don't know, whatever. Okay, this is a GMA potential, where the A refers to the exponent here. So here this is an exponential potential to the power A. And very important for what I'm gonna see is a soft potential. Soft means that here in zero is finite. It doesn't go to infinite, like for instance in the in the linear Jones potential. And going to infinite means that you have a size of the particle. Soft core, soft core, which is called the that means somehow that the particles can overlap. What happens here? Well, I'm gonna put, I will show you numerical results about this system, okay? So, numerical results. First of all, observation. If A, A, which is A is the exponential here of the potential, is smaller than two, the particles never aggregate. Okay, they are? You are mixing a small R with X. The other Sorry? Thing, I guess, eh? You have R for the, for the potential and X in the exponential. I guess it's the same. Yes, yeah. It should be the X should in be R, right? Eh? La formula. In la formula. You, ah. uh, that should be the same X as you have in the exponent, eh? Yeah? Sí. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Yes. What is different is the R. The R, the R is the, the, the typical range of the potential. Epsilon is the typical energy scale of the potential. But will, what will be more important for here for this potential will be the exponent A. Okay? Well, first thing, numerical results. If A is more than two, nothing more. Well, no aggregate, nothing. Um, maybe was a simple question. What prevents the particle from escaping? Well, I put here boundary conditions, so periodic boundary right. conditions. Yeah. I will show another simulation. Uh, what I'm going to do is to put many particles in a periodic boundary system with periodic boundary condition, and it will simulate this equation with this potential. With this potential. Okay, the particles interact via this potential. Okay, and then I will, what we will move essentially, we will fix air, the interaction, the number of particles, or the energy scale, which, which are not relevant parameters, and what we will use is. We will first move A, the parameter A, and then we will observe for A is more than two, nothing happens, the particles move around, Brown and Lee, etc. no problem. But we, when A is larger than two, I will show you what happens. On this, I put here A equal to three. And then what happens? First thing that happens is that if the diffusion is very large, nothing happens. The part, I repeat, the particles are all the time repelling, eh? They are all the time interacting with forces that uh, time to repel one each other. But, okay, temperature, diffusion. Okay, so uh, I've just shown you that when this, when the diffusion is large, of course, the diffusion means that the temperature is very low, the diffusion coefficient is very low, the particles move like crazy. No, but when, you decrease the fusion, despite the particles are all of them repelling, they, they cluster ice. Okay. Here, the nice thing is that the particles are all the time repelling. Eh? There is no attraction. Okay? The periodic boundary condition. Okay, it's a bit counterintuitive, of course. I will try to explain why this happens, how this happens mathematically, and why physically it happens. Okay? Uh, well, what you see at the end, this is a crystal of clusters. You know, or we all know what is a crystal. A crystal is a lattice with one particle per lattice size, well ordered, okay? A cluster crystal is a, instead of having one particle, you have many particles, you have a cluster. Here you have hexagonal symmetry, appears only for A is larger than two, and a small temperature. And there is some kind of periodicity. The periodicity is the distance between cluster, which is proportional to the interaction of the potential, okay? And, if, you put more, if I put more particles here, what do we obtain? We will obtain more particles in every cluster. Okay, well, now what we, I will show, try to explain is why this happened. I repeat, despite the particles, all of them repel. Okay, well, there is a very nice, uh, I always consider this, of, this paper by Dean, one of my, the papers I crucially read, read in my life, okay? This was a very influential paper. Many people in spin glasses, nafted matter, and micro microscopic uh, descriptions uh, should read. For any of my students in, in the master, I just said this is the first paper you have to read. Okay, this paper essentially 
is for this, for this uh, let's say, quantity that we can call uh, density. You can see this is sum for every part of a delta Dirac. Uh, is that for uh, you can obtain for the previous system of for this system of uh, sorry for this system of Brownian particles. Well, you know the system of Brownian particles for this quantity that you can call density of particle. You can obtain this equation. Okay, so it's a very nice equation where you have the diffusion term, where you have the interacting term between the particles, and then you have a noise term. Of course, there is always a gradient in before every term. Why? Because everything is conserved. The density of the particle is conserved. The particles are just moving around. They are not dying or reproducing or whatever. The pro this is an exact, this equation is exact. This is, writing down this equation and writing down the system of Brownian particles is the same. The, both of them have the same information. The problem with this equation is that nobody knows, at least us, to deal with. Not even numerically. Numerically because of this noise term. And it's noise term, you can see here is the root square of the, of the density. So we have to, so the full stochastic equation is um, nowadays unmanageable. Okay? But you can get, anyway, a lot of information about this. In particular, what we will do. I think that what anyone will, will do to forget about this, okay? But I will tell you how, how can we forget about this easily. Well, we don't non-dimensionalize the equation, of course, with typical parameters. You are dimensionalize the equation, and then you see that the noise intensity is now this. And then you can say, if I work in a system with large density enough, then I can delete this. Okay, and then I will come just to a typical, well, typical, a deterministic equation. So, of course, a difficult equation is, a, is an integral, it's an integral differential equation, it's a difficult one, but you can, you can work with it, okay? So, from, from now on, I forget about the fluctuation, that they are relevant, but you know more or less what fluctuation will do in the system. Yeah, but the, the important parameter was the, the value of the diffusion, the fluctuations, the noise that you are neglecting. Yeah, well, well essentially what you can see here, that the correlations are proportional to D, it is more and inversely proportional to the density. The larger the density you can work with, the more particles you have there. So it's a mean field, okay. typical mean field description, okay. okay? And then here the relevant parameters remain as D and the A in exponential. And then you can work with this equation without problem. What would, what would you do, pattern formation, linear stability analysis? Well, first of all, is this equation good enough? Let's make some analysis of this equation, numerical analysis. And here I will show you this equation, the numerical, uh, the the numerical analysis of this equation, and then we will see that essentially you get what, it, what you need, okay, for an exponential of this type with a equal to 3. Again, you take, this is for the density equation, not for the particle. You take what we obtain with the particles. There is no fluctuation, but you take the same. You obtain a crystal of finite mass cluster, you have you obtain the hexagonal symmetry. This happens again for I for A, sorry, larger than two and the temperature is small enough. And then you have you obtain the same periodicity. So this deterministic equation is already a good description of the stochastic particle system. But okay? This is for the density. Yeah, but no, no, here I do, there are no particles. Here is a continuous field that you call the density. I simulate this equation. And no, nothing to do with particles. Well, essentially, the integral of rho over the volume should be the number of particles. Right. Yeah, well, this is a comparison with the one, but this is a this different, this is now the continuous description. The question is, uh, you have the um, external structure. And the external structure, right? Yeah. And you know that there is a paper by Maradudin in 90 something, which say that the, the I don't tell you uh, exactly the reference, we say that if you have infinite system, then of course uh, the lowest configuration for charged particle, and I don't see charge here, is always the hexagonal structure. You know? It's always, sorry? Charge. If you have charged particle, then you, uh, the optimal configuration is for it? infinite system always the hexagonal. Yeah, well, hexagonal from an energetic point of view. Is the one that typically, uh, energetically less. Uh, no, typically. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, energetic 
we are now working on energy, energy approaches, and with the hexagonal, you see that the minimum, you obtain with the minimum. But of course, uh, I mean, equilibrium always related to minimum energy, that's clear. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Equilibrium always related to minimum of energy. Yeah, and the, the minimum of energy is an hexagonal. Yes. Okay, simple uh, example. Oh, sorry. Okay. Is that you say that for, for charge, uh, for electrons, for example, this would, uh, oh, one I electron in each side will be the equivalent configuration. Oh, for this, many, many particles in each side is the equivalent configuration. So it's quite different. No, this is what I want to clarify. No, I mean, but it's agonal again. It's agonal again. It's difficult to understand the design. Tell me what. So generally, in pattern formation, the, the symmetry is associated with the uh, degree of nonlinearity. When you write a non-linear yeah. equation, if you have a quadratic yeah. or a cube, here is a quadratic non-local non-linearity. You can see here. Yeah, that, that's it's a quadratic non-linearity, non-local, and also non and also conservative. Quadratic in row, in row. Yeah, normally doesn't give rise to excellence. So but this but this expansion around the station, the solution, so the. the and it's not exactly what is in the question. What I mean is that, that the, the rule of thumb is tell me the order of the nonlinearity. And it will tell me it will be a hexagon. And this seems to contradict this rule of thumb. I don't know. We, are, we have always seen hexagons. Eh? That's what I can tell you. I've never seen something different to hexagons. Yeah, if you tell me hexagons, I would say cubic. Yeah. But, this is a, but maybe here is. But it's different in the amplitude equation. But this is a different thing, the amplitude equation. Okay. This, is, this is a different thing. Okay, let me go on. Okay, this is a, so this description is a good description for the system of Brownian particles. Okay, and well then we made standard linear analysis of the homogeneous solution. Okay, and we go to the growth rate. And the growth rate tells us that, as many of you already seen in many of our talks, the growth rate depends on the Fourier transform the potential. We have shown this for system of verdict particle. We have shown this. At the end, we, are, we have seen for many years, if you have some kind of non-local interaction, is the Fourier transform the potential that tells you when you have pattern formation. In particular, for this type of functions, like the Jenga functions, if we need this, if we want this to be positive, then this has to be negative, at least for some values. And then when do you obtain that? For instance, if A is 2, this is, this, this is the Gaussian. The Gaussian is always positive. You won't obtain patterns with the Gaussian. This is the Gaussian with A equal 2. This is the potential Gaussian. And the Fourier transform of the Gaussian is a Gaussian, which is always positive. And then lambda will be always negative. OK? If A is equal 1, A equal 1, Exponential decay, and the Fourier transform of an exponential decay is always positive, and then here you never, you can never have a part because lambda, the growth rate, is always positive. And it is well known that when A is larger than 2 for this type of potential, the Fourier transform can have negative value, and that's why we have this condition, or let's say this frontier in, in A. A larger is more than 2. This explains mathematically why you may have patterns for this type of potential, even if the particles are repelling. But we already, of course, this is the, you, you, you can plot lambda. You can see lambda for a large D. If you decrease D, the diffusion, then you can see that the lambda uh, becomes positive, and then you can have a, a, a positive growth rate. And and then you can have patterns. In particular, it's also important to stress uh, that you made the, the, the small gradient expansion of this term, which is the one appearing here in the equation. This is the non locality, let's say. If you make the, uh, this expansion, then the, all these properties disappear. At least if you go, I think, I think that you have to go at least to, to fourth order. Pattern, that maybe the one we did with the pattern, we needed to go to fourth order. So you have the importance of the finite range or the non-locality of the interaction. But these are mathematical explanations. What is the physical or biological mechanism for this? So well, it's a, the Fourier transform of the potential. 
what is the, the real physical mechanism. I guess that most of you, at least, if think carefully on this, comes to the solution. Why the patterns appear even in the particles are then repelling? Well, typically because the repulsion of my neighbors is larger than the repulsion of in my cluster. Okay? You understand more or less the idea, no? Yeah, but the short range repulsion is larger than the long range. Oh. Sorry? The short range repulsion is larger. No, no. The problem here is when the intercluster repulsion in one cluster is larger than the repulsion from the, from the neighbor, then you have the patterns. So it's very important the, the forces of your, of your cluster, neighbor cluster. That's why, despite all the particles, we are all fighting and we are all, I, 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 I go away from you, but I prefer to be uh, also away from that guy and then from that guy, and at the end, you, you, that's why you aggregate. This is the biological or, let's say, physical mechanism, I repeat. Because the intercluster repulsion for neighbors exceeds the repulsion in the particles. And this appears typically inside the cluster if A is larger than 2. This is the, the physical mechanism. Let's say, I will go more into the details of this. Could you show something like this in one dimension with, with say, the I will try to show. I, I want to. better to have them like this instead of like that. Yeah, but also these two, they are also repelling these two guys, these two guys. Yeah, but okay. you, you can sum the, the exponentials and say that the. Yeah, that's what I will tell you now. That's what I will do now, okay? Okay, so this, uh, this is a physical mechanism. Well, let me, let me, and then, can we even explain a little bit more of this? Of course, we, you can obtain a solution of your, in 1D, you can obtain a solution close to zero, okay? And then, imagine that we are, you only think of you, your cluster, and the two neighboring clusters. And then the solution takes this form, where this H function, essentially, where C is the intercluster system, a function combines, this is the, let's say the repulsion inside your cluster, and these are the repulsion of the neighboring clusters. You can obtain analytically the, this expression, and then, taking into account these measures, this H acts as an effective potential as fed by the particle at, at the given position. Okay, and then what we will see, essentially we will see, what happens is we put here a, a, a potential with A equal one, or a potential with A equal three. This is the next slide. If I put if I put here equal one, H has a maximum here. For this, no clustering because the internal repulsion dominates. Okay, and then if you put for the for the other potential, for when A equal three, what you're saying is that the repulsion from neighbors dominates, and then you get clustering. So this is the physical, the mathematical mechanism for the transfer of the potential. The physical mechanism is the repulsion of the cluster. This, in particular, can tell us that you need, you, you cannot have, for instance, solitary solutions here because you need many clusters, no? But I'm not sure about this. Eh? Yes, okay. And uh, there is a not the same for the uh, choice of your potential. Did you try to other? And we are now trying with uh, different potential. The only property of the potential I'll tell you now is that the, it's a soft core potential. So that there is a Fourier transfer. Now we are working, of course, there are students working with a, a, a electrostatic potential, a magnetic potential, something like that. And then the property is that the Fourier transfer of the potential. But the Fourier transfer has to be six. Because you make very general statement. Yeah, it's a very general statement at full field. We, are, we, are, we start to work on magnetic dipoles, and then we also we have particles repelling or attract electrons, or even repelling. You know, it works. Okay, so let me go on now to the second part. Okay, equilibrium is a little bit boring, so let's go to the to non equilibrium. This, this is our, the most new part of what I'm going to tell you. Well, the simplest. Uh, generalization of equilibrium to non-equilibrium is via what people working in active matter typically do. <coughs> At least to put to the particles, to put, a, to, to put to the system a new degree of freedom, the orientation of the particles. So you put some kind of self propulsion to the particles, and then you see that essentially this was my system before, but now I put the self propulsion. 
on the particles. That means that you put the particles are in this way. And then this is a propulsion. So you know run and tumble of the bacteria, how it works more or less. But this is not run and tumble, it's a little bit more, more complicated, more continuous the tumbles of the particles. But this is essentially the, the simplest extension to non equilibrium of an, an equilibrium system, to put to the particles an orientation. This is what we call the self propelling thing. And what we want to study to see the self propulsion does or that or that, what does it to the system if it does something. At the end, of course, we will have here this is the, what we call the translational diffusion, and now appears a new diffusion coefficient that has to do with the rotational diffusion of the particles. Okay? So at the end, what we have now is again overdone system, Brownian system with relational diffusion and rotational diffusion, plus a propulsion, plus soft repulsion. Again, the particles will be all the time repelled. Okay, so it's the same system, but this is not the equilibrium. This breaks uh, temporal symmetry, and this is the typical non-equilibrium system. Okay, what happens to this here? Now, I, I will do the same, uh, I have time. I will do essentially the same. I will show you numerical results, and then I will try to explain what happens. Okay. Numerical results, again, you have to say. Okay? You have an spontaneous central cluster, crystal of cluster, again, the same, with a sagonal symmetry. Uh, the intercluster distance don't, does not depend on the number of particles. The more particles you put, the particles are in the cluster. And this happens again for the gen A potential if A is smaller than 2. Okay? See? Nothing new is happening. You can somehow say that the relevant parameters in the system are that this what is called the super system of the activity or the set propulsion modulus of the velocity or whatever. But you can form these three uh, <coughs> dimensional parameters. Well, essentially, again, you have the, the diffusion, the translational and the rotational diffusion. Essentially, increasing the persistence is like decreasing the rotational diffusion. Okay? And then, numerical, what do, we, what do we see? If we increase, this is our cluster crystal, if we increase the cell propulsion of the particle, the, class, the crystal melts. So in the, in the meantime, this is increasing U0. Okay, I will not show movies because you more or less can see what's happening. So what the, these are the particles. As, far, as long as you increase U0, which is the same proportion, then the particles start moving from one cluster to another. At the end, when U0 is large enough, everything is homogeneous again. Okay? We already see that U0 is like a diffusion coefficient. But now the next thing appears when you take a U0 moderate enough and you decrease the diffusion coefficient. Then the clusters get empty. This is the only non-equilibrium effect that we have seen in the system, but we think that it's interesting enough. I will show you the movie here. So this is, the, this is what we obtain. This is the new thing, the new feature we obtain in non-equilibrium. That the particles, and there is a radial in the cluster, the particles are all radially uh, organized. This is the, okay, and this is essentially what you see in the movie. See that these forms, uh, clusters, empty form. How do they move in the clusters? Are they rotating? Or? Mm. That's a new discussion. Uh, I'm not sure if they are, I, I don't see rotation, but I'm discussing with a student and he said that he sees rotation of the particle. Yeah. I don't see any. any the particles are moving, but they move very slowly. But empty clusters, you mean that they form an this, an yeah. ring? Anulus, a ring. Yeah. And then with this polarization. Okay, now we will try to explain this. Okay. The polarization is the, the, the vector of velocity? Yeah. It's the modulus, but you don't move. I don't understand. No, it's, it's not the vector of the velocity. It's the, the particles have an orientation, okay? Imagine you have an orientation, you have a system of particles, you put many particles there, anyone with a random orientation, okay? And then you move the particles following the orientation and this, and with this, you see, yes. okay? Then the time then would be, then you move, uh, the, you randomize the, the orientation of the particles that you move again. This is a random time. This is not the same because this is somehow, you don't change all the time, but they are, uh, let's say, diffusion and rotation. But take into account that theta is the orientation of the particle. Okay? I was here, no? You can see the moving again. 
and so how they are moving. And it is quite this pattern. It was very surprising for us in the beginning. We will try to, to explain this. We are not able yet to explain fully this. But we, we will try to give arguments for this. Okay? This is the non euclidean feature of this. Well, let's go to this. Okay. okay. Like, 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 a, like a stick, like a rod, not like a point. Yeah. With an arrow. Sorry. With an arrow. Imagine an arrow. Imagine you, I don't know. Uh, okay. Well, again, Dean Kawasaki. The problem is here that we have a new degree of freedom. The angle, the angle, how to explain <coughs> Dean Kawasaki equations is not a trivial thing. Jean Baptiste did a very good job with this. And we, we obtained them for directly to the deterministic one, he obtained this equation for the density of particles at a given position with a given orientation and a given time, t. OK. Then for this, and we're not entering into many details. And then we are going to analyze this equation. This is a very, no, it's a very complicated equation, but I can tell you how you can proceed. And this is, I think, jean Baptiste did a very good job with this. OK, first thing, let's define the angular Fourier transform of this density field. OK, the Fourier transform in the, in the angular in the angular variable. OK, then you obtain this equation for many modes, in fact, for infinite modes. OK, this is now the equation of the modes in the angular, of the angular for many modes. OK, and then here, what do you do with this equation? Let's go on. Again, let's do uh, stability analysis. The stability analysis now is very horrible. It's this way. You can find for a number of modes n. OK, and this is given by this polynomial. And in fact, here, the problem is that you have here, this is an infinite continuous fraction in the linear stability analysis. OK, but you can say several things. I will tell you what you can say. You say but you can say several. The problem here is that you, uh, this F depends at the same time of lambda. OK, you have lambda here. The, uh, it's a difficult thing. But you can say several things. First thing that you can say, for instance, I will not go into details. If when, when the, mo in the mobility, the, the persistent, the mobility, the self propulsion velocity u0 goes to zero, you obtain the lambda is what it has to do, what it has to be, the Brownian, the Brownian lambda. Okay. When d is large, when the diffusion, the rotational diffusion is very large, you obtain this expression, the lambda. And now appears uh, an effective diffusion coefficient which is d plus something. That tells you like, that the persistence is somehow acting as a, an effective diffusion for the system. That's why increasing u0, u is like increasing the diffusion. And now, but we, we want still to go more on the details, OK? What can I ask? Uh, next question. I have this equation for infinite modes. How many modes are enough to describe the system? How many modes? 2, 20, 40, 3, 1? One? 1 for sure, no. But <laughs> well, let's see. OK, numerically, we saw that the number of modes depends on the u0 coefficient. So when u0 is, these are for different number of modes, the lambda growth rate. Here, for when the u0 is small enough, with 3, it's OK. But when u0 is large enough, you need, you need at least 13 modes. Then you have problems. Okay, start, start here, I start, you start to, to, to well, you understand me, okay? Uh, when well, you, you, to saturate, sorry, to saturate, you start, that, 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 you start to saturate, well, that, uh, the number of modes already 15, 14 modes. What do you call modes? Modes is the number of these equations, the number of these. One, two, three, 20, you need, in fact, it's infinite, but how many do you need? for a proper description of the system. What we show is that at least you need when you use 13. I think you, you have to explain the, the language of red dots, for instance. Well, the number of modes here then is... Yeah, no. re, ah. uh, sorry, okay. sorry, I didn't want to enter into too many details because... Uh, yeah. Well, 3, 5, 7 is a orange, 11 blue. So you can see the saturation here when, you know, at least for the blue. And here, you have seen that all of them are the same, more or less, so with three, it's OK. OK, so you need many modes. But anyway, we can go on in more details with the, with the, with the analysis 
Uh, what we need is, well, anyway, any 15 volts, but I'm going to take only two. What happens analytically with that? Because with only two modes, the, the questions are very nice. Um, are very standard in active matter. Because you have a question for two modes. Essentially, the first mode is the density, and the second mode is what you can call the polarization field. OK? And then you have two equations for two modes. Essentially, this, this is when u series is 1, 0. They only have the equation of the Kawasaki standard. But when you have, and now you have the polarization is coupled to the polarization field. And this polarization is what has to make the cluster entity. OK? And then you have an expression for the polarization field. And with these two equations, even if numerically it's not, uh, it's not very appropriate, it's physically easy enough to obtain everything. Now we will, I will show the results for this equation. First thing, this mode, the, 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 the statement is that these two mode equations already describe the system qualitatively very well. Okay. In numerical simulations, in two dimensions, we recover the crystals and we recover the polarization field. These are, these are simulations of these two equations. In one dimension, we even obtain the, the emptiness of the clusters. In two equations, no. I don't know why. Jean-Baptiste had problems with the numerical diffusion. I don't know. We could not find in two dimensions the clusters, the empty clusters. In one dimension, yes, we have problems with simulating this. OK, but we can still try to understand a little bit more what's happening there. For instance, you can at the end consider that the physical mechanism is that the cluster appear because the forces of the other cluster. And then instead of this expression, you can say that there is an effective confining potential in the system. The typical uh, potential, uh, ammonic potential. So that you have somehow a force like this. And then if you take this expression, then you can see the anti in the simulation. So I repeat that to catch the two modes is not quantitatively very accurate, but retains the basic mechanism. So this equation, which is a new equation that you, you cannot, you don't see this, this equation in a typical active matter systems, but this new equation has solution with cluster, crystal cluster with emptiness. Okay? Then you can go even more to more analytic, but I don't want to, to go on. I think that it's already enough. Let me go just to the summary of this. And then summary, soft potential. So from the beginning, I said that the potential is soft. So it has to be uh, non-infinite in zero. But it can lead to the formation of cluster at high densities, low noises, both for passive and Brownian particles. The necessary condition is that the Fourier transform of the potential has to be has to have some negative values. If you use in particular the JMA potential, which is the standard one in soft matter, what you need is that A has to be larger than two. Uh, continuum descriptions are accurate and help to understand the new physical mechanism. We introduce a new physical mechanism that is the that the cluster appears because the the interaction with the other clusters. And then the applications to biological systems. This is our challenge. So, uh, well, this is, uh, and then let me finish that Emilio was presently in a journey for in South America. And so on, I don't know, I don't remember who told him, oh, this is like a, a poem from Jorge Luis Borges that tells you that no nos une el amor sino el espanto. Those love does not unite us, but fright. Okay, right? I think I, it's a nice thing, of course, it's Horacio here, I will not say the contrary, <laughs> but I prefer in a way this, uh, even if individuals compete, they can, uh, they can form an aggregate. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We already had a number of questions during the presentation. The, the empty clusters. Um, it's always a challenge to understand the Yeah, it is. it is. That's why I'm asking. The, um, in the particle simulation, you have just one particle thing. Is that correct? Or is yeah, only one particle thing. Yeah. So that in the, in the, um, in the density? Yeah, but you see, you see, you, you, you see something like, in, in one dimension, you see something like this. I mean, if you move with many, many particles, a lot of... Something like this. You see this, and then you, you increase or decrease D, and then you see this. You start to see this. One D. And in 2D, you see with the, 
with the, I already showed, no, into with, with this effective potential confining, you see the, the, the hole. And that is, we already have seen some uh, rings when we study masses in particular. But they were, they, there, there were two uh, interaction scales. Here there is only one interaction scale. But there is the polarization. So I, I imagine that in the non-equilibrium situation, the bigger the e, uh, U0 parameter, the, the bigger the, the rings are. No, the bigger U0, the rings disappear. In but fact, the crystal, the, the crystal melts. Because as I said, U0 is uh, like diffusion. It's like increasing diffusion. Yeah, but I mean, there's, I suppose it increases until it, the crystal breaks. Can you predict the, the mm, value of U0 well, at which I, this I, I haven't seen that transition. Well, because what we put essentially, you zero, you see the cluster crystal, and then you increase you zero more, and then you it melts. And then when you put you zero with the cluster crystal, and you decrease D, then you see the, the holes. But I, I haven't seen the direct, the direct transition from the holes to the, to the melt, to the liquid. What happens if particles are not point particles? Well, that's, that's also the next step. That now we are considering how, uh, not soft core potentials, in particles with a given size. And we, are, we have a student in Italy working on this. Uh, essentially, what the student is seeing is that the cluster are formed. And inside the cluster, the particles are well ordered. But then it is not true that what you need is soft core. But when we did this, uh, two months ago, we mm, well, to do, we needed a soft core <laughs> because uh, otherwise you cannot compute. Well, of course, you have some uh, hard core you can obtain the for some of them you can obtain the, the Fourier transform, but not in general. If it is infinite, you can obtain the Fourier uh, the transform. So we, we we focus on soft core because we also wanted to uh, be applied to the overlapping of the particles. And then in the beginning, certainly Emilio and myself believed that with hard core you won't obtain. Uh, classic crystal, but now these students in classic crystal. The, the real example you put at the beginning had some. Yeah, and that's, that's the next, as I said, to understand the holes and to put hard, hard core in. But, but if this is the case, then the initial density or the total density would yeah. be another parameter. Yeah, yeah, of course. But we've got the, in, in soft matter, the, the, the side, uh, don't remember the name. What's the name of the? The skewed volume. volume. This is a very important parameter. A curiosity. Um, in the first simulation you were showing, what does forbid the whole cluster to drift? Sorry, in the? The cluster in the simulation that you showed, when there are all the particles and noise, why the cluster, once it's formed, does not drift? You have periodic boundary conditions. Yeah, they, they remain there, they're not moving. Why, why the cluster as a whole does not have a translational motion? What does forbid well, the translation? Uh, well, boundary, periodic boundary well they, they remain something that uh, well I, I, I don't know how I, this is the right answer but for instance when we started to put uh, the activity of the particles typically in an active system what the what the activity does is to move the, the to move the, the pattern but here we we didn't see that it should move and because there are functions of particles the diffusion the, the, the Questions? That's I have one question. Okay. Is it true that uh, the effective potential is harmonic oscillator? Sorry, if the potential is. Uh, when, you, uh, when you show a force, it's uh, linear to uh, distance. That means uh, effective potential is harmonic oscillator. Yeah. Is it true? Sorry, but I didn't understand. Sorry. I mean, you show the forces which produce on the last part of the object. Yeah. It's proportional gamma x. It means. Uh, Ah, yeah, yeah. Effective the, potential yeah. Is harmonic oscillator. Yeah. No, no. We, what, what do we say is that instead of using many particles interacting with their forces for the last part of the talk, you, you say, well, the, the cluster is formed because you have 
an effective uh, force that they make the cluster uh, aggregate. So let's put an effective potential there, an harmonic potential, and let's see if it works. And it works. Is that the that, that, that answer yeah, to you? Maybe this cluster later. I mean, okay. yes. But if you put an harmonic potential, no, you, you then harmonic we put an harmonic potential, everything works, and it's easy to analytically. The point is simply common because sometimes it all is. And if you have repulsion forces, then and to, to conserve a circular symmetry, the particle organized themselves in, in this ring structure, okay. in story. I mean, this is harmonic okay. But again, repulsion force. Therefore, I don't understand how in your case. But this is a repulsion forces with an harmonic potential, so you have different. Post Coulomb forces. Well, Coulomb forces for two electrons, repulsion. Not two electrons. Well, what we say that you have an internal potential, but if you modify this by some confining potential, you, there can be in some, let's say, in some limit, it can be equivalent. And if you put it, because at the end, what makes the particles cluster is that the external force over there of the, of the neighboring cluster. So you can understand that like an external potential. So essentially it can be the same. Or similar. Like symmetry breaking, internal symmetry breaking in the, in the cluster. It can be very similar. Okay. I was very happy to see such a vivid discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, so thanks. thanks again, Christobal. And next week we'll have <laughs>